So I'd like to just take a moment first um, to express appreciation and gratitude. Um, first and foremost to obviously the person that means more than anybody in my life and the person that's responsible for the vision of this gathering, for creating this gathering, all the details you have no idea went into this gathering. So for a moment I'd like to thank my wife. Felina. <laughs> I'd like in specific to thank and weave and collaborate with those that have walked before me. So certainly that goes back to Gary and everybody else, but specifically today to the other presenters. Because you made it easy for me to come now and summarize and integrate and collaborate. I, I couldn't have literally designed any better Joanna speaking about the power of words and meanings and being specific with words because that will culminate in something important. Nancy, the power of images, metaphor and meaning. You couldn't have known the study I was going to present. Thank you for that. <laughs> Sarah Jane talking about your body and being, having a felt sense and standing and being your bodies. Perfect. I really don't even have to be here. You did it all. Uh, da Damon on beliefs and settings, how we think about what we do. So now I just get to summarize, basically. So my vision today at the outset was to somehow um, being a chiropractor, combine how emotions and pain weave and work together. And so um, I'll start with a story and a question first. If you were a surgeon and you needed your hip replaced, who would you turn to for that? Another surgeon. If you were a psychiatrist with depression, who might you turn to? Another psychiatrist, a massage therapist with tight muscles might go to? A massage therapist and a chiropractor with back pain would go to? No, <laughs> not when you're married to Alina. Um, but that's a very important concept because it changed my life. In other words, I'd spent a lot of money and a lot of years knowing what pain and back pain meant and what caused it and what initiated it and how it was physiologically working in the body and what tissues were... Str so believe me, I can tell you more than you ever want to know about back pain. So now, let's go to a time um, a few years ago. I had already learned EFT. I was certainly married, um, in relationship with an EFT master at the time. And I had been working in the yard too hard one day. Now, I know better, right? I mean, if anybody, I teach my patients all the time how much to do and not to do, to listen to their bodies, to not overdo one activity. But there was a lot to get done, and I just didn't listen. <laughs> to myself. I was a bad patient that day. And so I was digging and yard working and spent the entire day doing far too much in the yard and basically walked in the house like this. I'm okay. I know what I did. It's all right. I'll use my ice and I'll do my stretches. And she's like, well, let's just tap on. I'm like, it's not an emotional issue, okay? I know the tapping is good stuff. Really, I do. I, I value it so much. Um, <laughs> For other people. No, no, if it, was, if it was emotional, if it had to do with anything that was more than me digging in the yard, it would be useful. But I know what I did. And I know I just overdid it. I know how to take care of it. She's like, what are you, like, scared to tap on? It's like, <laughs> no, we can tap, whatever, fine. <laughs> now, as it turns out, that day working in the yard, I didn't think had any emotional implications until... Even though my back's in spasm and it's making me, well, I feel frustrated by it, right? Because I'm, you know, not like, I'm a six in the Enneagram. I kind of think about things. I'm pretty left brain overall. Um, so yeah, I'm a little frustrated by it. And, and maybe I'm a little frustrated because I had to spend all day on it. And maybe I'm frustrated because I had to spend all day because I'm having to get the house ready for sale. And maybe I'm having to get the house ready for sale because I just went through a divorce. And maybe I'm a little angry about that. And maybe... <laughs> but it's not an emotional issue. I overdid it in the yard. <laughs> so let's just say that day changed my life. That at the one hand, it scared the heck out of me because it had the potential to ruin my professional career. <laughs> Because that meant that every person that came in for back pain might have emotional stuff that I'd have to refer out for, in which case I didn't have a clientele anymore. 
But that is a point that I think that is worth facing when we have to re-paradigm what we think the world looks like, especially when it has to do with what we're spending every day doing. Um, but it brings up the idea and the concept of what psychosomatic refers to, right? So psyche is mind and soma is body and never the twain shall meet according to old science which is now obviously old science because we know it's next to impossible to have a thought or a belief that turns into a feeling that doesn't affect the body that doesn't cause what you think about or feel about to affect the there's no way to separate so when we talk about pain and we talk about EFT and we talk about emotions pain is literally your way of interpreting what you're feeling and I had this idea today that I was going to come out and we're at Bastyr University, it's prestigious. I'm going to play scientist today because I have this picture of my favorite professor of chiropractic school, Dr. Murphy, who could recite literally the page number of the paragraph of a study that he read 13 years ago and tell it like you, he read it yesterday. And I have this vision that someday I'm going to be like that and I'm not, but I keep believing it anyway. So I prepared my studies for today and and it was fascinating because I love bridging the gap from science to mainstream and I've just always been a connector and a bridge gapper from here to here. And the longer I sat here today, I said, I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, literally it changed today. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I don't have as much fun when I do it. I have this belief that I can do it well and I really don't do it so well. So I changed it. <laughs> For those of you that saw me in the chapel at lunchtime and were wondering what I was doing there, I was rewriting my talk. Now, there are a couple of ideas that people have, actually there are thousands of ideas about how pain and how we think about pain um, relate. I, I thought I'd bring up a few. How many people know, for example, John Sarno, right? The heretic MD that ran a neuro rehab, wrote lots of books, mind over back pain. Basically, the thing that most people take away is all the people that have back pain out there in the world are basically unexpressed, angry people be a synopsis. So he writes a whole book on it, but it actually can come down to that. What, what he really says, and now I just realized that Chris asked me to stay still back here and that's the last thing that I've done. So, <laughs> sorry Chris. <Okay. laughs> Even though I told him to not move. It is. All right. Um, so John Sarno is an MD that ran a new, neuro rehab place and basically what he discovered and what he found, which is really not new to anybody here, um, and I do love that everybody here are a bunch of hand rubbing, head tapping, wacko, you know, we're this great group that just integrates and collaborates and, and it's a fabulous group of people, so thank you for being here. Um, so John spoke to the idea, which was quite revolutionary within the medical circles, that when we feel things, when we feel emotions, and we don't express them, and we bottle them up, that that's got to go somewhere. I know, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's got to go somewhere, and as he described it, it goes into tension in the body. So he came up with the diagnosis called tension myositis syndrome, which is basically tight muscle syndrome from stress, which results from unexpressed emotions, which results from being in pain. And all you have to do is counsel people a couple times that that's what they're doing, and they get better. Now, it worked for him, right? It really it did. did. The study after study that he showed, thousands and thousands of people came to his clinic. He actually stopped referring out to physical therapy. He stopped teaching him exercise. He stopped teaching him everything else, except this is what you're doing. Now get better. And a lot of people did. So that's one idea. Another one, certainly Hans Selye, general adaptation syndrome, the father of stress syndrome, said, look, those biological systems were meant to be under some stress. Cyber tooth tiger comes chasing after you, wherever that was, or maybe it was a snow leopard, anything. Anyway, something comes after you fiercely <laughs> um, with great sovereignty, and you know, fight, flight, freeze to do something. Your body knows it needs to do something to respond appropriately in the situation. That's fine. The problem is, is that when our body starts to adapt to that chronic, chronic level of stress, biologically, our hormones, 
the chemicals in our brain, the neurotransmitters, everything starts to cause your body to adapt to that stress in its attempt to reach equilibrium. The problem is, is that it has a lot of effects that don't help your body. Right? So cortisol levels, which I'll talk more about, there are a lot of things in the body that start to raise. Your body gets used to them, and that results often in pain, high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease. We can go on and on with the different chronic diseases in our current culture resulting from ongoing stress. Stress is the key. If you want to have a bridge builder for any hospital, for any discussion, for anybody that thinks that EFT is woo-woo, stress is your word. Okay? <laughs> Stress is the word. Everybody say it. Stress is the word. Exactly. Because you can use that anywhere. You can use that with athletes. You can use that in the hospital setting. You can use that with psychotherapists. You can use, you can use that with anybody. And you've got plenty of background to say that as stress levels increase, what is one thing that EFT does? It relieves stress. And that's your door opening. Then you get in the door, and as Alina would always tell the story, when she used to try to speak at the local hospital and say, try EFT on everything, the door would close every time. I'd be speaking about metaphysical concepts, and she's like, how do you get in? I'm like, well, because when I started off, I started talking, off of, talking with, about back pain. And then when I did neck pain, and then I did back and neck pain, and then I did back, neck pain, and stress, and then I did back, neck pain, stress, and ways to relieve stress, and then, and here I am stepping forward again. <laughs> so, poor Chris. Um, so, stress is your word. Excuse me. Now, a few things I wanted to talk about. So John Sarno first, and basically he said that there are two primary things that, um, that move us in the direction of stress and this tension syndrome of pain. And one of them is our personality traits. Some of us tend to be more type A, as he would describe them, personality traits that tend to get stressed more. And we can all look to all our body-mind systems that, that types, types of people and ways we react that tend to move more towards stress than others. And then he said, and then there are life situations. Duh, okay. So in other words, you have a personality tendency and you have a life situation that tends to cause these times where you get stressed, you hold it, and if you're in a society that doesn't let emotions flow freely and you hold them, they end up in your body. Now an aside, about emotions, and, and this is completely my own personal opinion. I've heard Alina and many other people say that EFT works with basically, at the root of every problem is an emotion. And I would actually say for me, and, and I might be getting your terminology wrong, but from my mind, it's either an unexpressed emotion or it's a dysfunctional emotion. And what I mean by that is not that an emotion is good or bad or any one is good or bad. Right? Anger has appropriate here and anger is inappropriate here, etc. My, in my teaching, my learning, my understanding, when we experience something newly, it is absolutely natural to have an emotion about it, whether it's grief, sadness, anger, and any of the emotions. But when we tend to repeat them unnecessarily from the same situation over and over and over, and we tell the stories about it over and over and over. And every time somebody reminds us of that same situation, we feel that when it basically gets recycled, that's not healthy. And that's what leads to the blockages that I think EFT helps the most with. So when I'm talking about emotions and pain, I'm not saying emotions are bad that cause pain. I think emotions are part of the greatest part of us as human beings, but only when they flow freely or they flow without blockage. When I, um, when I work with patients, for me, and I think that this would apply most to those practitioners that are not just solo EFT practitioners. You might be a psychotherapist, you might be a massage therapist, you might be a nurse, you may be any other profession that is using, how many, actually let me ask you, how many people are in, for example, the mental health profession? Okay, nursing, caregiving, and let's include caregiving in some way. Okay, EFT solo. Okay, so we have a random mix plus lots of others, obviously I'm not mentioning. I think we have to find ways, especially, for example, when we're working with pain, and as a chiropractor, obviously that's the primary reason that people come to me. 
is we have to be able to successfully, if we wish to use EFT with them, bridge that gap from the expectation they walk in with of what kind of care they're going to receive to how I broach the subject of working with their emotions and or with EFT, right? Because if somebody walks into me as a chiropractor, I got this great tool. Let's, they're looking at me like I'm crazy, right? So for me, most people now, it really, we've hit a paradigm shift where people understand that pain and what they feel in their body and especially how they feel and what they think have some connection, right? It's, it's pretty rare to find somebody that doesn't get that on some degree. So, for example, when a patient of mine that's a friend comes in the other day, she's 65 years old, she comes in with this back pain, going in her butt and sciatica. She's already had the x-ray, the MRI, da 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 right? So she gives me the whole story, and I'm listening. And this is a very type A person. And, um, and I'm listening. I have a listening for, as a physician, what physically may be going on. I have to. It's my responsibility to be listening of what tests have been done, what does it sound like, what does it look like, et cetera. Right? I still have to come up with a diagnosis and a tro appropriate treatment protocol, et cetera. But at the same time, I also always have a listening for what's going on underneath. Right? That ear is always there for me now, especially after you. Right? <laughs> I love you. Just kidding. Um, but really, after understanding that there's always some interconnection. Because even if it's just pain alone that's purely physical, you think they got some thoughts about that? You think they got some feelings about the pain that might possibly be now intertwined with it, especially if it's chronic pain? So even if it started, we'll, with, we'll just say a very physical only, mostly thing. Certainly then what happens is the emotional feeling about who am I with that? What does that mean for me? What is the meaning behind that? And that often will relate to the piece that the, the EFT dovetails into. So. When this person walks in and I start listening and I start asking my medical type questions of how long have you had it and what does it feel like and what kind of things aggravate it, what I'm listening for is what was, and I might throw in, and what was happening around the time that you heard it? Oh, nothing, I, you know, it, I woke up with it. Any stress going on in your life around that time? No. I don't believe you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because I know you and I know things that are happening in your life that you just aren't connecting yet. So there's a gentle lead, right? Um, so what does it mean for you to have this? What, what, what is it like to be you? That's uh, my favorite. I totally stole that from Alina. Tell me what, it li what it's like to be you. I want to be you. What's that like with regards to this? And so... What then came up is, well, this is an old person's condition and I'm not old. Right? And if I admit to this happening or like give it any space in my life, and if it's not gone tomorrow, that means I'm like, I'm having to deal with getting old stuff. Oh. Oh. Okay. I'll put that aside because that might be as much as they're willing to do in that moment. But all of a sudden, I have a really important piece of the puzzle. So with pain, Pain is literally just a signal, because they could be describing it as ache, as stiffness, as, as this, as that. Pain is one sensation. It's one that people will use the most, are very comfortable with using the word pain. And sometimes they don't know how else to describe it but pain. But pain is a very useful one to, for me to explore further about what that means. And meaning is everything with pain. There is another researcher, um, Eisenberg, and what she's done, very fascinating studies, is she's actually found that the part of the brain, the anterior cingulate gyrus, gyrus, has an area in the brain that has a complete overlap. Number one, it has a lot to do with pain processing, physical pain processing, but it also has a lot to do with, for example, what happens socially when I feel excluded when I feel not accepted, when I feel not a part of the group, when I feel not bonded or connected to, and guess what? They're starting to find that they are sharing the same wiring and same neurons, and they may be collaborating with each other. 
So, all of a sudden, there's new meaning to me feeling left out, me being angry or frustrated about that, and, all, and feeling more pain in my neck. That they're actually using the same neuronal connections and sharing that part of the brain. Fascinating. I mean, we are in a time of brain science. That's mind-blowing. Yeah, that's good. It, it, it is. I love this one. I, I'm going to give you an example. So here's where I'm going to bridge the gap with research for a moment. So I'm going to give a plug to a journal for a second called the Explore. Explore, the Journal of Science and Healing. Larry Dossi is the primary editor. My friend Stephen Schwartz is a regular contributor. And in this most recent issue, I'm just going to read a short quote. It sure. It's called Explore, the Journal of Science and, and Healing. But Explore is good enough for you to find it. And it's really the leading one of the most leading edge journals um, speaking to consciousness, speaking to healing, speaking to energy psychology, speaking to many of the different things. And we'll also give a plug to Dawson's journal, which really anything that's coming out with energy psychology and EFT is coming through that. Really important, I think, that we start to have a languaging for some of the research. And some of it, I know, is just haughty languaging for what you're already saying, but it helps you bridge a gap with those people for which the science is important. So in this last issue, the, the article is called Symbolic Diseases and Mind-Body Co-Emergence, A Challenge for Psychoneuroimmunology. Cool. Listen to this and then I'll interpret it. But it's, it's EFT. Physical diseases that appear to be symbolic somatic representations of patients' personal meanings or individual stories continue to be reported in the medical literature. She's a pain in my neck, and then I got a pain in the neck. That's it. And they give story after story in the literature of cases of people coming in, a woman with rheumatoid arthritis, that when she started to describe her story, she, found she felt bound up in her relationship. She was limited by her life. I mean, all these things that were describing the inability to move in her life and develop arthritis in her joints. Another woman who had been sexually abused very early on, developed later in her life uterine bleeding and a lot of other menstrual related problems, and once she realized the connection, they went away. And these are all case studies in the literature where somebody's story about what happened, somebody's belief, then had a direct correspondence with the physical condition. Later in the article, Under, when it ends, the importance of symbolic diseases, or SDs. Symbolic diseases are vivid pointers to the role of subjectivity, in other words, how we perceive it to be, in physical disease. And it opens up clinical horizons that are not currently allowed by the biomedical models. And symbolic diseases suggest that meaning and the body are cooperative. It appears that, it, I know. So for those people that read science, this is like, are you serious that says that? <laughs> it appears that a co-emergent framework commonly allows recovery from chronic illnesses that are unresponsive to biomedical treatment, and this needs research exploration. OK? <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. All right, seriously. So it's out there. Okay, it's not what you're reading on the front of Time Magazine, but it's out there, and we can use that. So there are models out there that we can use to describe what happens. And basically, whether it's pain or stress, what we do know is that it all of a sudden raises our stress levels. It raises the cortisol in our body. That stress, that cortisol and the other hormones, they start to cause muscle tightness. They start to cause our heart to beat. Basically, they cause our sympathetic response, okay? Like I'm feeling a little bit right now, right? The heart's beating a little faster, my eyes are a little wider, right? All those things. So when that happens, what does tapping do? Well, tapping, let me do one more journal piece. Hold on, I love this, okay. I love playing with the languaging for something so simple. Okay, here we go. The neurochemistry of counter conditioning, acupressure desensitization in psychotherapy. This is what you do. Give yourselves a round of applause. Okay. James Lane in um, Energy Psychology says, a growing body of literature indicates that, get this, imaginal exposure, this is what you do 
This is your visualization that you were talking about. I'm imagining myself in this situation, matrix re-imprinting. I'm picturing myself at 12 years old and this is happening. Okay, I have this in my consciousness. This is imaginal exposure paired with acupressure or rubbing or tapping, whatever you're doing using the meridian points, reduces midbrain hyperarousal and it counter conditions anxiety and traumatic memories. Recent research indicates that manual stimulation of these acupuncture points produces opioids and serotonin and GABA and regulates cortisol. It reduces pain, slows heart rate, decreases anxiety, shuts off fight or flight freeze response, regulates the autonomic nervous system and creates a sense of calm. This relaxation response reciprocally inhibits anxiety and creates rapid desensitization to traumatic stimuli. Okay. This is scientific jargon for what you're doing when you're doing this with your little kid, right? Or your mother or your friend. You're using, and we understand, we borrow from other literature, <laughs> from acupuncture literature, what, what happens when they're stimulating acupuncture points? We borrow that. What happens in psychotherapy when we do imaginal exposure? What happens to brain waves when we decrease cortisol? What Okay, so this is the collaboration and the time that's so exciting and also so important when I hear people that are working in mental health wards here or people that are working in the VA and we start to have a growing, um, a growing understanding of not only what we already have in our back pocket, but we get inspired to actually do more. You know, the opportunity to write up case studies. You know, poor Alina is getting ready for those of you that don't know to go to Israel at 10 o'clock tonight. She's going to be working with those people that have been subject to war in Israel last year from a bombing and hopefully getting enough case study information to give back to Dawson to put into some of the literature that we're working with PTSD. Wow. Now, she's a practitioner just like many of you are, but okay, I've got to learn what to do here and get these forms. And I'm just starting to think about that what I'm doing can contribute to the much bigger vision, right? Because research literature starts to open doors that wouldn't happen otherwise. Total blank. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, even though I even though I totally blanked out after that, I went off course. <laughs> I don't accept that. Even though I just blanked out and I don't feel badly about it, I just need to pause long enough for it to come back. I'll have the articles out on the table in the back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I do, keep, I do keep research that I use like that. And um, EFT Universe has a wonderful, um, you can get the abstracts on, on the EFT Universe site. Um, ASAP also has a good site for understanding how to do, if you want to begin to do some of the research. Um, David Feinstein has a wonderful article where he had to um, butt and rebut um, after an article he wrote. People that had, okay, well, they say it's like this and this is where you're wrong. And he went back and forth rebuttals. So they're fascinating to read. They really are. And I remember one night that I finally started to look at the research and I was like up for late, very late, because it's like a rabbit hole and you start to, when you, once you start to enjoy that, if you do, <laughs> it's fascinating. All right. Um, I wanted to get back to uh, patients for a moment. So with pain. You know, there, you have it in your outline, some research pieces that I put together and also some questions. Let me ask you this. I want you to say if, for example, everybody think of some time in their body that they had some pain. It may have been an injury. It may have been a car accident. It may have been just you woke up with it. Can everybody come up with some time in their time that they had pain? How many people when you had it thought that it might have had an emotional cause? Good. Well, we're in an EFT room, so of course, right? How many people didn't be brave? Like it just, it was a physical thing, it was diagnosed, you know what, I have an x-ray to prove it, an MRI, it happened after this, right? Okay, so I want you to just think, um, actually I want you to partner up with the person next to you, and I want you to just for, you will have one minute to go, okay, if I thought it was physical, and it had some emotional component, what might that have been? I'm going to make it up, not that it was, but I want you to just discuss for one minute, so that somebody else can hear somebody else saying it, what my physical issue, illness, pain, let's focus on pain was, and what might emotional causality or involvement may have been partaking in that. You have one minute, go ahead.
I wanted to do a little piece on what is some of the research that's out there, and then I'm going to move in a slightly different direction. Just so you know, I timed that exercise per perfectly so that in my pause I could catch back up to where I would need it to be. That's efficient. Okay. So some of the research studies that are out there that you can use or talk about is some of the EFT w working with PTSD studies are showing about 86% statistically significant improvement in six sessions or under. Okay, one of the studies showed 70% within three visits, 86% within six visits. Fabulous, fabulous stuff, because PTSD, for any of you that know, is probably about going to be the top of your list of tough conditions to work with. So if there are studies showing 86% success rate with that, you guys are golden. All right. Pain diminishment. 68% in two studies, right around that 60 to 70% range with EFT within 20 minutes. So they did one with healthcare workers. I love this one because, you know, if you were to read this one in the journals, and they talk about EFT effectiveness with healthcare workers, reduction in anxiety, um, emotional distress, pain, et cetera. When you read further, you realize, wait a minute, that was one of Gary Craig's conferences they did it at. Because that's what they're talking about. The EFT healthcare workers that were done in group, measured pre and post while in a conference, and published that. We could have done that today. We Missed opportunity. Next, next year. All right. Um, now, one of the things that actually Dawson does speak about is, okay, in these studies that we're seeing about a 70% improvement with reductions in pain, he speaks to, because in a good research, you're going to say, well, what might be the cause for that? What might be we be doing wrong? Where's our strengths? Where's our weaknesses? And he's saying maybe 30% of the time that it is true organic pathology, that it's absolutely the cause of the pain, but if we can affect it 70% of the time, either 70% is emotionally caused or at least involved. Right? So please be careful with saying we help everything all the time. You know, if you came to me and told me that, I'd shut the door because I don't believe you because nothing helps everything all of the time. Does it have the potential to help most of the people most of the time? Yeah, research backs you up. And that's all you need. And any reasonable person in the health profession or science, that's what they want to hear. Fibromyalgia syndrome, an eight-week program of self-treatment, significantly decreased pain rumination, decreased feelings of helplessness, increased overall activity, and this was without working with an EFT coach, which I do recommend, but even with eight weeks class online by themselves, significant results. Another one, um, after car accident PTSD related. So post-traumatic stress disorder for people that had been in a car accident, they were taught EFT in two sessions, there was 100% immediate improvement afterwards, and those who continued afterwards, a significant amount showed when they did brainwave studies, a significant decrease in cortical arousal. In other words, those stress levels that are measured on brainwave for how high stress they are in their brain, sh those that continued working on themselves showed a significant decrease, not only in the PTSD symptoms, but also in bra brainwave function. Did you know that stuff was out here? Some of you may have, but maybe many did not. They compared EFT to EMDR, somewhere between 4 and 15 sessions. Um, and they showed, again, about an 80% to, 80 to 90% reduction in PTSD symptoms, pretty equivalent to EMDR in that study. Okay? They did another, Dawson did a study on measuring cortisol reduction, which is a really important part. So if I do this, and then I can measure cortisol as decreased, that opens all kinds of doors for me because I now have a measurable way that I objectively decrease stress, which, believe me, VA, everybody else is interested, how can we decrease stress levels that result in changes in behavior, conditions, etc. Now, pain is primarily a central pathway. It's not so much a, a left or right pathway in the central nervous system. But what this work also did is it took me in a different direction that I didn't expect beside EFT. So I become involved with understanding and, see, and having an absolute fascination with how we use our brain. Okay? And I could go into a very long discussion just on right brain and left brain, but just to really take it very small, and you help me with this. For left brain, I'm not going to say people, but left brain traits, can you help me with what some of those would be? Language, Language analytical. analytical thinking, reasoning. 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 More linear, in other words, 
um, it's much more of a this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's much more logical. Causal. It makes sense. Hmm? Causal. Causal. So a timeline. So I do this, and then this happens as a result of that. Are those important skills? <laughs> you bet, especially if you're putting on a conference. Right? Okay, you do this, then this, and then this, and you follow up on this. Very important. Right brain skills, traits. Creativity. Creativity. Emotional experience. Well, there's some subtleties in that, but keep going. Intuition, intuitive sense. Anybody see, hmm? Singing. So more creative expression, sure, in different artistic. Impersonation. Impersonation. Okay, because sure, because you're going to have to think outside of yourself to think and be like another person. Yes, you can, and creativity is a big category for right brain traits. But there's also others. There's being able to see places that you haven't gone. There's the ability to think not just logically, but outside the box. So a lot of different things. Tends more fun. If one lives right brain, it tends to be more fun. Unless you didn't take care of the left brain stuff, in which case it cannot be fun, too, right? <laughs> Oops, where's the projector? <laughs> um, therefore, what we're really looking for is whole brain thinking but because we tend to be in a very left brain oriented society, tendency wise, most of us are having to learn to use more right brain thinking. So I work with a, a woman who developed the idea called right brain aerobics. It's basically just like exercising this prior to the brain, just like we'd exercise any other muscle, right? And so exercises and ways for thinking, and it, you can use it for how do I tap my intuition? We have these exercises called like tap your inner genius. All it is is okay, I write down, we do this exercise, and then we write down, okay, inner genius, how am I going to, um, how am I going to get this talk done when what I had done is not what I want to do, and I've got to give it in an hour? I don't know, you should have thought of that before. Um, how, so we, ha we start to develop dialogues with that part of our brain, right? So starting to use writing, which is very different, we start to tap other ways of thinking. We start to look at the day with what are six impossible things that could never happen today, but I don't know. I'm just going to start stretch how I think about my day in my life. So I'm going to do a very quick exercise that shows you kind of like uh, it's at the base. It's just like beginning tapping on your karate chop is for EFT. I'm going to do in a few minutes a beginning what we call right brain startup exercise. So everybody put their feet flat on the ground. You can put your hands wherever's comfortable on your lap if you like. Now, the beauty of this exercise is that you can do it in the morning, you can do it before a meeting, you can do it any time that you want to reduce stress or think more creatively and really start to use the right part of your brain. So let's say you're working with a tough client and you're just not getting through because you're thinking a certain way and it's just not, you're not having that breakthrough that you know you can have with them. This might be a way to use it for that. So the steps are simple and they're in threes and they utilize all the physiological responses that'll help you relax it doesn't have tapping in it. She didn't know about that. We're working on that. But. So what I want you to do first is just move three times in your chair. Shrug your shoulders, move. Just get in your body, get comfortable. Good. Now let's go ahead and take three deep breaths. Nice if you have water in front of you. Please use it if you don't imagine. And let's just take three sips of water. Hydrating is important. We all know that. Especially for kicking butt. She showed it in the video. Okay, good. All right. With your eyes closed now, if that's okay with you, I want you to go ahead. We're just going to do a quick inventory. I want you to check the inventory of the space around you, the noise, the light, the room you're in, temperature. Then do th a quick check-in on your body. How am I doing? Is there pain? Is there not? Am I comfortable? How's my body doing? And then just do a quick check-in on your emotional state. I'm happy. I'm tired. I'm excited. I'm inspired. I'm whatever. I really like his voice a lot when my eyes are closed. Whatever it is. Next, I want you to do three gratitudes, three things in your life, be it your work, your family life, here, three things that you're grateful for and let yourself feel it. I'll give you about 30 seconds for that. Yeah, 
Let the feeling spread. That's good. You heart mathers are already doing that. Okay. Next. For some people, this is challenging, but not in this room. I want you to affirm three things about yourself. Be it about your physical being, be it about your mental capacity, be it about your emotional well-being, be it about what a good listener you are, whatever. And once you've done that, simply keep your eyes closed and we're going to be silent. What would normally be three minutes, but we'll just take one minute right now. So just go into your silence. And when I do the silence, I've started to develop an idea that I have this feeling of this wave like coming into my right brain. I kind of, but you can do whatever you'd like. You could just simply be silent. Slowly open your eyes. Okay. Now I know we all know we should meditate, and I know we all want to, and all of those, but sometimes it seems daunting. And sometimes it seems too big, because why bother meditating for five minutes if you don't do it for at least a half hour? It's just a waste of time anyway. <laughs> or whatever that says. Right Brain Startup is just simply the foundation exercise that we begin with for beginning and then we go from there. But sometimes in the morning, I can do that so easily. Before coming in here, I can do that so easily. And it begins to really activate the right brain. All the pieces of that simple exercise, the three breaths, the three sips of water, the three gratitude. And you know what? There's a ton of research for everything we just did. There's more research on gratitude, on meditative focus states, and it's just exploding. So you want to teach a beginning exercise to a client to relax, to begin a relaxation response as a collaborative approach to EFT or as a pre-approach to a session. Just know that there are tools like that. Um, there's, um, it's not my website, rightbrainaerobics.com, but I'm associated with it. I help teach it. Um, right now, my pri primary web presence is as the chiropractic zone. But what do I want to conclude with? Sure, the three things. Good. So I really think of them from the outside in. So three physical movements to just get situated and get present. Three deep breaths. Deep breaths. Three, sips of three sips of water. Three inventories. External, physical, the environment, the physical, and your psychological emotional state. Three affirming thoughts about yourself. I have a problem with the word affirmation. I just don't like it, so I change it to affirming. And three minutes of silence. Three minutes of silence. Did I miss? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the three gratitudes. I apologize. Inventory is great. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. Three gratitudes. So I look at it as gratitude for those things, especially in my environment. And then I do self-affirmations. I just kind of think of it coming deeper and deeper into me. That's how I think about it. But if you did it the other way, I think you'd be okay. All right. So to conclude and, and wind things down, because we're going to have a panel here in a few minutes, when people come to you with pain, it's very real to them, and they have a lot of story about it. Please respect that. You may have other thoughts about it and what it means, etc. Please honor what they come to you with, the seriousness, the realness, etc., because it is for them. However, also know that there's any condition known to man that you could have that could be with pain or without pain. 
So you are not necessarily healing, fixing, changing the condition. You know, I'm always, when I see in the research literature, EFT for scoliosis, and immediately I'm looking at, are they going to tell me they changed the shape of their spine with EFT? Or am I looking for they change the pain? They change the muscle tension level. So in other words, just know that any condition that somebody comes in with that's painful, with EFT you can help to some degree, and maybe completely. There's nothing that you can't because there's always a mind-body connection between all of them. You already know that, but hopefully that just reaffirms for you that you can help everybody to some extent, even if it's giving them greater peace and acceptance with the condition they have, which can be incredibly healing. Know that you have a gift that is so powerful that really you've been given a gift. As Gary said, it's a gift from God. Please honor it that way and know and use it that way and share it that way. And I know you do. I'm just affirming you to be able to and know with confidence that there's literature behind you that it's not just a woo-woo thing. Right? So, in conclusion, um, what you do can help a lot of people, especially those in pain. There's a reason why it happens. We're still understanding it. I thank you for doing it. I thank you for the times you're going to do it that you haven't done it yet. And, um, and thank you. That's what I want to say.